titles, capacities. Brother Terry Arnold, I want him to come today. He's got a word from the Lord today. Is that okay? Yeah. Let's prepare our hearts as Brother Arnold comes. And everyone said, praise the Lord. I've already been blessed today. My wife and I was just talking after the class. Brother Sadler has really blessed us already. That class was just awesome. Absolutely awesome. Are you a better preacher than you are a teacher? He just did an awesome job. And so uh, I could go home right now and say it's been wonderful. Now, the last time I was here, I was getting over pneumonia. And last night I started developing bronchitis. There's just something about you folks. <laughs> and uh, someone said last night that it must be the Middle Tennessee air. Hey, I was born and raised in Middle Tennessee. It's where I'm from. <clears throat> Maybe I'm just so used to the smog of Chattanooga. I don't know. But uh, in all honesty, in all seriousness, I am so honored to be here today with my friends, Brother and Sister Sadler, and I mean that with all my heart. They're very dear friends to us, and uh, we love your pastor and his wife, and Sister Beth, and Brian, and Sarah, and Emery, and uh, uh, let me get the last one, Aubrey. I got it. The old man still got it. Not long, but I've got it. And uh, we just love this family so much. Uh, I've seen these kids grow up. And uh, Brian, I'm not your uncle or nothing. But Brother Arnold, just, I'm very proud of you. I want you to know that. And I, your dad talks about you in the highest regard. And I just am very proud of you and your ministry. And I'm proud of my friend and the great church that God has helped him raise up here in Smyrna. <laughs> Amen. You that were not a part of the initial part of it, I was actually. I was his home missions director when he started and probably one of the first preachers that came preach for him. And believe me, you would just need to know this church has come a long way from its beginning. And God is so good, isn't he? Isn't God just good to us? Praise the Lord. He's just so good to us. What brought us to the area yesterday was Frontline Conference in Murfreesboro for all of our home missionaries, and I was honored to be able to speak to them, and what a tremendous move of God we experienced in that Frontline Conference. And, of course, your pastor is part of that being the, I can't get it right, Tennessee North American Mission. It's easier for me to say home missions uh, secretary. But uh, what a tremendous conference that was. Your pastor and Brother Neil did a great job putting that together. And we just give them honor we give you honor this church and uh, we're just so very honored to be here today glad to have my wife with me she truly is my better half amen and uh, we're so opposite it's it's just unreal I'm always hot she's always cold I'm always positive she's always never mind <clears throat> We do agree on some things. We both like Mexican food. Come on now, folks. Surely, surely that's what's going to be served at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Surely. Amen. But I love Sister Penny. I, I, I joke with her and I say, well, you know, for a battery to be hot, you have to have a positive and a negative side. And so you decide which one you are. No, I love my sweet wife. 38 years we've been married. 38 years. 37 of those have been very good. No, I, I love her so much, and I honor her today. I have a word from the Lord. I called your pastor last week, or he called, no, I called you. And I said, I have a word from the Lord for your church. Uh, and please do not make me have to preach like Jeff Arnold for, to get the word across because I can't do that today. I mentioned this yesterday. I, I got a call to preach home, uh, Holy Ghost rallies in South Carolina, 
And the reason why I was called is because Jeff Arnold was supposed to have preached it, and he canceled at the last moment. So the home issues director called me and said, hey, Brother Arnold, you come preach these. That way I don't have to change the marquee. I don't have to change the flyers. And I can just tell everybody Brother Arnold's coming to preach. And, uh, and you should have seen the look on their faces when they walked in the door and noticed Jeff Arnold wasn't there. And, I, and no, I'll just get that cleared out. He is not my brother. I've been asked that so many times, only in the Lord. He's from Brooklyn. I'm from Nashville, two different worlds. Amen. But uh, because of my voice not being what it should be, but God's going to help me. And so don't, don't make me have to preach hellfire and brimstone to get the, cross, the message across. But here's what the Lord is going to do today. Without a lot of fanfare, and I don't care whether you hang from chandeliers or not, we don't even have one in this room. But this is what God's going to do for somebody. God told me that there is going to be a spirit of deliverance in this church. But not only that, God is going to restore somebody today. Somebody who is maybe cold in your spirit. Someone that has been away from God maybe for a while. Someone that may be very faithful to coming to church, but you just don't have the fire you used to have. God's fixing to take care of that for you. If you will let him do it. Oh, I just felt faith rise up in my heart. And I ain't even started preaching, but I just feel the Holy Ghost beginning to rise. You need to get a hold of that right now. I'm just telling you before I start preaching, God is wanting to do something tremendous in your life this morning in this service. I'm going to talk to somebody right now. You've asked yourself, is it always going to be this way? My answer to you is this. No, not if you allow God to have this moment in your heart and in your life. God can change your life in a moment of time if you'll allow him to do it. I believe it in Jesus' name. Could we stand for the reading of the word? Turning your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 9. Begin the verse 1, a very familiar story, I'm sure, to most of us. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priests and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues. And that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. That ought to be, that ought to settle the question right there, shouldn't it? Who is the Lord? It's Jesus. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Drop down to verse 17, the conclusion of this event. And Ananias went his way entered into the house and putting his hands on him said brother Saul the Lord even Jesus that, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and he arose and was baptized Saul's journey along the road of Damascus I want to preach this morning from the thought, the divine interruption, the divine interruption. Let's all pray. Jesus, you're so good. I give you honor and praise. I give you this message, Lord, right now. I give you myself. I ask you, Lord, to touch my body, touch my voice. Help us, oh God, touch my mind and my spirit that I might deliver the word, Lord, with the right spirit and that your people might receive it. Because I feel your spirit even now moving throughout these pews. And you're touching hearts right now, preparing their minds and their hearts to receive the word. I give you praise for it. And I thank you for what's going to be done in this service for the glory of God. And all the church said, Amen. Shake your neighbor's hand and tell him God's fixing to do something for you in this service. God bless you. You may be seated. 
Praise the Lord. We all know the story well from the book of Genesis where God created all things and then after everything that you see, he waited till the sixth day and on that day the Bible says that he formed man out of the dust of the ground and then breathed into that man the breath of life. A little later, he said it was not good that man should be alone, so he caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and out of Adam he took a rib, and from that rib he created and molded a woman. And Adam called her name Eve. And it was told to both of those people, the human race at that time, of every tree of the garden of you may eat. But there is one that you need to stay away from. I'm paraphrasing. And that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day that you eat thereof, you will die. And of course, if you look to the story at length in its full context, it's not talking about that the moment he, they eat of the fruit, they will drop dead. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the process of death will begin in their life once they eat of the forbidden. Once they have tasted of that which God had told them not to eat, that begins the process. Is anybody hearing me right now? Begins the process of spiritual death. And in their case, both spiritual and physical. And the Bible says concerning this, Paul wrote about it in Romans 5, 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So touch your neighbor and tell them that means you. We need to understand today that the root cause of all sin can be traced to pride and rebellion. We know this because of the story of Adam and Eve, because the serpent came to beguile her or to tempt her, and the words he used to do so attracted to her pride. God knows that the moment you eat of this, you will be like God to know good and evil. And the scripture specifically said when, when she looked at the fruit, and it appeased her eyes, and it appeased her flesh, and it appeased her psyche because now I understand why God don't want me to eat that. He doesn't want me to have the same knowledge he has that she partook. And death came upon all men. And from that time to the present age, every man, woman, boy, girl, that is living, every baby that is born, is born into this thing that is called the curse of sin. Amen. Pride caused Eve to partake, and pride and rebellion are the facilitators of sin. I'm just going to be bold right now. You cannot sin without pride. You cannot sin until you first of all set aside God's will and replace it with your self-will, Pastor. And that leads to sin. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We were all born into sin. Therefore, we all have the capacity to let pride overtake us. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on that because we're all guilty. We all have the ability to rebel. It is in our sinful nature. Men are not lost because of the amount or even type of sin they commit. They are lost because they were born into sin. Amen. John 3, 18, you know it very well. He that believeth on me is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
So we were all born into this thing called the curse of sin. We all had the sentence of death upon us. That little innocent baby that was born into this world, when it comes to the age of knowing right and wrong and maturity, that baby will need to make its own choice whether to live for God or not. Amen. Because it, no matter how precious it is, is born into this world a sinner. A few years ago, pop star Lady Gaga makes me gag-gag myself, but Lady Gaga wrote and recorded a number one hit entitled Born This Way. In it, she glorified her lesbian lifestyle and justified her sin by saying, I was just born this way. Well, this morning, I've got good news for Lady Gaga and every man, woman, boy, and girl that is here this morning that was born into sin. Jesus said, you can be born again. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. One preacher said it this way. You can be born once and die twice. Or you can be born twice and die once. This body is going to return to the dust. I understand that. But your soul will live forever somewhere one day. And I want to be born again. How about you? I want to be in the presence of the Lord for eternity. That is why Jesus said in John 3, verse 3, Verily I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? But Jesus answered, Verily, verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh but that which is born of the Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Is Spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Amen. Life before Jesus Christ is one of self-centeredness, pride, rebellion, and sin. But life after Jesus Christ is one of, li is one of life, joy, peace, and and righteousness. Can I get an amen this morning? In fact, Apostle Paul described the new life well in Romans 14 and 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. He goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Oh, things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Somebody say praise the Lord. Am I looking at any born again people today? Am I looking at any new creatures in Christ Jesus today where old things have passed away and all things have become new? Amen. It goes without saying, I think we all know this by experience, but Sin is way too powerful for us to be able to handle ourselves. Sin is way too powerful for us to be able to save ourselves or others. Only Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sin, who rose again to conquer death, hell, and the grave, only he has the power to deliver, to save, to cleanse from all sin. Oh, praise God. Now, first of the year, you may not have done it. Many people did. Many people made New Year's resolutions. Did anybody do that, make a New Year's resolution? Nobody? Good. We're all spiritual here this morning. You know, New Year's, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to exercise more. I'm going to eat more chocolate cake. Whatever it can be. I'm going to save money. I'm going to get debt free. We all make a lot of different promises. But statistically, statistics tell us that most people who make those kind of reformations, uh, promises to our, ourselves, New Year's resolutions, break them within three months. 
Amen. I want to be skinny. I just don't like what it takes to get there. Actually, I'm skinnier today than what I was last time I was here. I've lost 30 pounds. Do not clap. Do not clap. Do not clap. Because I am not going to promise you what I'm going to look like the next time I'm here. But my doctor called the other day and scared me half to death. You know, they have, a, I'm thinking about changing doctors, actually. And uh, so it's not about my weight this time, it's about my sugar. And so it's amazing when you can't drink chocolate shakes and you can't eat ice cream and you can't eat chocolate chip cookies and no more Twinkies and no more honey buns and no more donuts. And everybody's mad right now as I'm speaking. And no more French fries and you cannot get a hamburger any longer. And no more Coca 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 Colas, and uh, and uh, it's just amazing when you drop so many things that have sugar in it. What is left? Have you looked lately? I stopped the other day to a market just to try to find a little snack, and I, honest to God, I could not find nothing in that store I could eat. And I said, forget it. I'll fast. So we make these promises to ourselves. We make these resolutions. And we most of the time find out we don't have the power within our own self. You may have made the spiritual uh, promise to yourself. I'm going to pray more this year. I'm going to give more. I'm going to fast more. I'm, my pastor is never going to have a problem. Amen. I'm going to be more faithful. I'm going to come to church. And we all understand that it's easy, it's easy to make a commitment that our consecration will not cash. Amen. It's easy for us to make a promise that it's so easily broken at times. Why is that? It's because, as Jesus said, your spirit indeed is willing, but your flesh, I want to say your flesh. Pinch your neighbor beside and see if they're fleshy. See, see if they're breathing. If they're asleep, wake them up. The flesh is weak. So there are oftentimes God would love to do things in our lives, but we just won't allow him to do so. So we understand today that I don't have the power to save myself. I just don't. I, I, Paul said the things that I would do, I don't do. The things that I wish I wouldn't do, those are the things I find myself doing. There is a war going on in my members. So who's going to give me the victory? He said only Jesus can give me the victory. I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord, who gives me the victory in my life. I don't have the power, but guess who does? Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. I don't have the ability, but guess who does? Jesus does. And everyone say amen. You see, that is the power of the gospel. It will do what we cannot do. The cross was God's divine interruption between life and death, sin and righteousness, heaven and hell. Oh, somebody say praise the Lord. Apostle Paul goes on to say in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Somebody say praise the Lord. So sin will always take you further than you ever intended to go. And it will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. But thanks be unto God. Because of his divine interruption at Calvary. If you will just surrender to him. Jesus can bring you back to him. Saved cleansed, healed, restored, delivered. I'm here to tell somebody, you can't do it, but Jesus can. You can't save yourself, but Jesus can. Oh, I've come to lift up Jesus. Would somebody lift him up with me? Oh, praise God. Woo. Oh, hallelujah. 
Oh, I'm feeling better now. There are crossroads of life that each of us will face. It's times of decision <coughs> that lives are either blessed or broken, saved or lost, delivered or bound, restored or rejected. To some degree, we are all products of decisions that we have made in our journey of life. I have made both good and bad decisions. I've been both blessed and I have suffered loss depending on which decision I chose to make. But I am so thankful. Oh, am I so thankful, Brother Mark, that God allows you turns. I am so thankful that when I was not good to myself, when I was an idiot, anybody been an idiot besides me? Amen. Come on, somebody. Please don't make me feel alone in here. Oh, come on. How many have ever said something you shouldn't have said, done something you knew you shouldn't have done? Hello, come on, somebody. I need to come on. Everybody get in the boat with me, please. Come on. Help me out. Come on. How many of how many today uh, there's some time in your life you weren't where you need to be with God and you knew it? Come on, somebody. But how many are thankful for the grace and the mercy of God that kept pulling you and kept reaching for you? He never gave up on me. And because of his mercy and because of his grace, I stand here today cleansed, saved, healed, restored. Oh, praise God. Oh, I feel like having a fit. I'm thankful for his amazing grace. So before you point your finger at somebody, my mama used to say, remember something, you got three fingers pointing back. Before you judge others, you better be thankful. You better just step back and really think, where would you be if not for his mercy? I'm so glad that God came at pivotal points in my life and gave to my life a divine interruption that caused me to stop to reflect and to repent. In fact, the word repentance itself means to turn around. You go in this direction, turn around and go the other. Come on, somebody. I'm just going to tell it like it is. Lamentations 3.22. Here we go. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not all consumed. Is anybody hearing me right now? before you get up on your religious high horse and think you're really something because you pay your tithes. Hello, somebody. I'm here to tell you, if it wasn't for the mercy of God, you would be sitting in that pew today. Come on, somebody, help me. Oh, we are all here by the grace of God. Her story one time, I probably shouldn't say this. But there's a lot of things I shouldn't say that I go ahead and say. I heard a story one time, it's a true story. The pastor was telling me it happened, it happened to him. A couple of guys in the church who had money decided they didn't like how pastor was preaching because he was really preaching against sin. And he was preaching about holiness and living right. And they just decided what they're going to do. They're going to starve that preacher out. But they just stop paying their tithes. We'll starve them out. He'll either quit preaching like that or he'll leave one or the other. I don't even have to finish that story. You know how it ended. The preacher's still there. The guys with the money are gone. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we get so full of pride of ourselves sometimes 
Amen. You better, you better be thankful to God. You've got a shepherd that loves you and will stand here on his two feet and preach the word of God with clarity because he loves your soul. Oh, praise God. Of the Lord's mercy, we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new. Brother Taylor, Taylor, are you hearing me? They are new every morning. Every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Backslider, you're not as far from God as you think you are. His mercies are new every morning. It, true, it is true what they say. Jesus is just as close as the mention of his name. Why is that? It's because throughout the word of God, we can see examples of God giving to men that didn't deserve it a divine interruption. In the book of Genesis, the Bible says that the thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually. But the Bible also said, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord, everybody. Abraham was called by God to sacrifice his own son, Isaac. But God stopped him in his tracks, gave him a divine interruption, and provided himself a sacrifice. Moses is leading the children of Israel out of Egypt until all of a sudden they had the Red Sea before them and Pharaoh's army is chasing them from behind. You could say they were between a rock and a hard place, but God sent a divine interruption during the night and east wind began to blow and it blew upon that water all night long. You know the story. The waters parted and they walked across on dry ground. Why? Because God knows how to give a divine interruption at the right time and the right place. Children of Israel got into the desert on the other side of the Red Sea. Time passes. You know how, isn't it amazing how time passes? We forget how good God's been. And we start complaining. Won't you husbands poke your wife and tell them, won't you stop complaining? I don't see how many husbands do that. You guys are wise. You know, sometimes don't you don't need to do what the preacher says. Only when I'm in the book. And that wasn't in the book. I was just going to see how stupid some of you guys are. I think it could be said we all complain. And they started to complain, murmuring, complaining to the pastor. We don't like how you're pastoring. We don't like how you're leading us. Would God we had stayed in Egypt? Come on, this is not my message, but I've seen it too many times. People get saved and they're in the church a while and all of a sudden they find fault with everybody and everything. And they have forgotten the mercy and the goodness of God. Where the Lord has brought them from to where they, don't you understand? I'm not getting on to anybody. I'm preaching generically because I don't know any of y'all. Hallelujah. And I'm here to tell you, I'm just no people. I know how we are. And you, all I'm asking you to do is, before you start complaining, start counting your blessings. Start thinking about how good God has been to you. Oh, come on, somebody. Praise the Lord. So they start complaining. Would God we died in Egypt? Moses prayed. Thank God for a praying pastor. And God sent manna from heaven, water from a rock. Three Hebrew boys are thrown into the fiery furnace, but God was with them. Amen? And the king declared, I see a fourth man walking in the fire. 
Daniel is thrown into the lion's den for praying three times a day. But God, oh, hallelujah, sent a divine interruption into that situation, and he shut the lion's mouth. Oh, somebody say praise the Lord. I call that holy lockjaw. I'm here to tell you, the Bible calls the devil a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But I know a God who is able to lock his jaw. Come on, somebody. I know a God who is able to bring a divine interruption into your situation. Whoa. Oh, somebody say praise the Lord. Whoa. The disciples whom Jesus loved. They have now scattered. The Roman soldiers have scourged him. They have beaten him. They have humiliated him. And finally, they crucified him. He dies. They bury him in a borrowed tomb. All seemed lost until three days later. God sends a divine interruption into that death situation and all of a sudden there's an earthquake the stone is rolled away the Holy Spirit returns into that body and Jesus rises from the grave in victory. Amen. I'm preaching to somebody right now. Your situation means may seem dead and dry, but God knows how to breathe life back into that dead situation. Somebody help me right now. Does anybody need a divine interruption in your life? God is reaching right now. Oh, let's praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, let's be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Worship the Lord with me, church. Worship the Lord with me, church. Sinner friend, sinner friend, you are not a lost cause. You are not a lost cause. God knows how to stop you in your tracks. All you need to do is surrender to him. Obey the gospel. All you need is a divine interruption. Sinner friend, you do not have to be lost. You do not have to split hell wide open. You're sitting here this morning. There's still breath in your body. You are breathing, and that is the mercy of God upon you. I'm talking to somebody. Backslider, I don't care how cold you may be. I don't even care what you've done since you've been back out in the world. My God is able in a moment of time to stop you in your tracks and to restore the joy of the Lord back into your spirit. Oh, somebody, help me preach, would you? God is one to turn somebody's life around somebody's wanting to, God's wanting to stop you in your tracks before you head into eternity don't allow sin to keep carrying you down the road of the destruction saint of God I'm going to talk to you I don't know what you're going through. I'm not your pastor. I don't know what mess you might have made <laughs> because of some decisions you have made. I don't know about what you're facing in your life. But out of this crowd this morning, I guarantee, I guarantee there are some people facing some things that no one else knows about. No one. You haven't told your husband. And husband, you haven't told your wife. The kids don't know. The pastor don't know. But God knows. God knows where you are today. Oh, somebody say praise the Lord. For nothing is hidden from him. I don't know what you're facing. But I do know. A God who has said, I will never, I will 
ever leave you. And I will never forsake you. You're not hearing me, are you? I'm telling you, God is saying, I don't care if you turn your back on me. I will never leave you. I don't care if you find yourself in a bar tonight. God is saying, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You're going to feel my conviction no matter where you are, no matter what you're involved in. You're not going to be a very good center backslider because everywhere you go, you're going to feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost because Jesus said, not me, Jesus has said, I will never leave you. Not only do I know a God who never leaves us, I know a God who knows how to send a divine interruption into your situation. He can step on your boat. He can step into your tomb. He can show up in your lion's den. He can be the fourth man in the fire. He will be your manna from heaven and your water from the rock. Oh, yes, he can, ladies and gentlemen. Our God is able to do that. Can you give God some praise right now? Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. And for you clock watchers, I'm about to close. Go back to my text. Saul of Tarsus is on his way to Damascus. Tell you a little bit about him. He was a student of Jewish law, having studied under one of the most prominent scholars of his day, Gamaliel. He was passionate about what he believed. He thought he was doing the Lord's work by persecuting the church. And with papers of authority in his hand, he had the authority to imprison and even execute Christians. And he's on his way to Damascus to carry out the orders of the high priest until God in his mercy sent a divine interruption along the road to Damascus. There was a light, a voice, a revelation, a command. It was a divine interruption that would forever change his life. But not only his life, it would change the direction and the life of the church. Somebody say, praise the Lord. And even our direction and our destiny today. Saul, who would later become Apostle Paul, expressed his gratitude for this divine interruption. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm sure you know it well. But Paul said this, For I am the least of the apostles, then am not me to be called an apostle because I persecute the church of God. Watch this. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in Oh, I feel the grace of God moving right now. Ah. Grace. Calvary was God's ultimate divine interruption. Romans 5, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, but Yet for eventually for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So somewhere between yesterday's regrets and tomorrow's eternity stands an old rugged cross. It is stained with blood. And it still has a wondrous attraction for me. 
I remember as a child growing up at the first church, Brother Beckton would sit occasionally at the piano and play so beautifully. And I thought, man, I want to play like Brother Beckton. I did learn to play, but I also learned that nobody can play like Brother Beckton. One of the, my favorite hymns, you don't hear it much anymore in church, but it is that old hymn, the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, has a wondrous attraction for me. For it was on that old rugged cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon my sin and set me free. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in the Lord, I have come to remind all of us today that Calvary was God's ultimate divine interruption to stop you on your road to destruction. And God is arresting somebody today. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. God is trying to stop you before you keep going down the journey of the road to destruction. And God is asking you, would you come? I want the musicians to come. Sister Beth, help me out. Will the church please stand? We're not going to do a normal, what some might call a normal altar call. I'm going to call all of those, any, whether you're saved or lost, whether you are in a position or you even are a backslider. But if you feel God calling you, if you feel God speaking to your heart, if you are a saint of God, but you're under such a weight, a load of despair, and you need God to do something in your life, I want you to join me up front right now. Oh, Ramaya Sinner, lay your sin down at his feet. Backslider, lay your cares, your failures whatever the case may be, just lay them down here at the feet of the cross. Saint of God, won't you come and just lay your burden? Come on, everybody, those that would want to pray, this altar is open because God has already spoke to me. He said there's going to be somebody here that needs restoration. There's going to be somebody here that needs to repent of their sins. There's going to be somebody here that needs the weight lifted up off their shoulder. And nobody can do that but you. Nobody can turn around but you. Nobody can lay down your burden but you. But God has sent me by today to stop us, to arrest us where we are. Ministers, would you go through the crowd and pray with folks? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.